Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the CCP specialty update, which is conducted by the Ceylon College of Physicians. Each month, this uh, specialty update is conducted in uh, collaboration with one of our sister colleges or associations. And this month, uh, our collaboration is with the Association of Sri Lankan Neurologists. So I have with me uh, Dr. Senaka Bandusen, who is the president of the Association of Sri Lankan Neurologists. Um, we have a session with three eminent speakers to speak on various uh, topics related to neurology. May I invite uh, my colleague to Senaka to, we are both Senakas today, so <laughs> uh, to uh, introduce the speakers yeah. and get on with the proceedings. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Senaka, for giving us this opportunity to collaborate with you all on this very important meeting. This is a regular meeting that has been happening over the years, and we have had many uh, updates before also. So today we have an interesting lineup of three very eminent neurologists with vast experience. And uh, uh, first, let me introduce the first speaker, Dr. Gamini Patirana. He's the consultant neurologist at National Hospital of Sri Lanka, and he's also the president-elect of the Association of Sri Lanka Neurologists. And he'll be taking over the reins of ASN very soon. And uh, he has special interest in stroke and has been in the forefront of improving stroke care in the country. And uh, today, Garni is going to talk to us on stroke management and updates. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Seneca and uh, both Senecas uh, for the kind words of introduction. And especially for CCP and the council and the president for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today and update on stroke management. We all know stroke has two main types, ischemic and hemorrhagic. 85% of them are ischemic and the rest mostly are hemorrhagic. Uh, the lot of advances have taken place in the ischemic stroke management over the last couple of decades. And we know that stroke kills patients as well as it makes them disabled. About 6% uh, die immediately. That's the recent uh, registry data that we had a couple of months, a couple of years ago. And about another 19% die within the first month. Significant amount of deaths happening. And out of the rest, half almost become disabled with dependency. Another half uh, disabled with independency. And this is uh, in the third to fifth cause of death in many countries. And depending on the country, the fatality and the mort uh, mortality where it stands can differ slightly, but this is at the forefront in the mortality and also disability in the adult community. And this disease does not affect only the patient, it affects the family. Once the uh, breadwinner of the family or mother or father, whoever gets a stroke, it becomes a problem for the family. And it affects the uh, development of the family, the children's schooling is affected, uh, financial situation is affected. So it affects the family in a big way. And largely, when you have too many families like this, it affects the community. Uh, because these patients and families, they are mostly take from the community rather than they contribute to the community. A modified ranking scale is what we use to uh, assess or uh, uh, assess the disability. If you are doing any research to uh, measure the disability, this is what had been used in many researches. And if you are going on research, we need numbers to do research. So disability is assessed by modified ranking scale. And the problem with stroke patients is that they have long-term disability. So people have looked at 90-day disability as the end point in research. Whenever you do some intervention, they look at the 90-day disability as a, as a measure of uh, improvement or, or whatever. And uh, zero, one, two is where we are trying to uh, reach uh, the independent. Uh, zero is no symptoms. One, with no significant disability, they can independently do things still. 
and two also is somewhere in the uh, independent stage. You can see this is a, a analysis of uh, endovascular treatment trial, 90 day disability score. You can see the MRS score given above zero to six. And below you have two arms indicating the intervention arm and the control arm. You can see the in, in the intervention arm, most patients have, uh, you see in zero, one and two compared to the bottom one and the number of deaths also reduced. So that's a significant improvement in this particular trial. It's just to highlight what the MRS scale is. And it's important that uh, when a patient come with a stroke that you do a non-contrast CT brain. This is done mainly to rule out hemorrhage, but it may look normal in a patient with ischemia. Uh, having said that, you may see certain hyperacute changes on the CT scan. You can see on the left side, the middle uh, dense MCA sign on the uh, left side. If you carefully look on the right image, you can see opacification of the lenticular nucleus. If you compare on the other opposite side. And here again, you are seeing the dense MCA sign on the right side. And again, the middle image, you are seeing the opacification of the lenticular nucleus. And on the right side image, you are seeing the uh, established infarct. You can see the full MCA territory is infarcted. If you see this kind of CT scan, generally we do not go for reperfusion therapies because the chance of hemorrhage is going to be high. And another sign that you look for in, in a acutely done CT scan is loss of insular ribbon sign. You can see on the right hemisphere, the insular cortex, you can see the uh, gray white demarcation, the gray matter is white here. This is called the insular ribbon, which is not there on the opposite side. So that's loss of insular ribbon sign is a sign of acute stroke. And also you can see the dot sign in the MCA territory in the uh, sylvian fissure, you can see the acute blood clot there. Similarly, you can see the bacillar thrombus on this one, up to here, there's no clot, but on the right side image, you have seen the bright signal. Now, when you're looking at the non-contrast CT, uh, you may not see the infarcted area clearly, but if you walk into the CT room, get the radiologist to do what's called stroke window, then you might see the infarcted area. So there's something that should be done in the non-contrast CT if you're not seeing it clearly. Now, recently I had a patient with a uh, hemiplegia and my house officer sent me the image. He, she said the CT looks normal. When you put it on the X-ray screen, it's normal. But on the image, I saw there's infarct. If you can see here, hypodensity enlarged, you can clearly see the MCA infarction. But I went back and looked at the picture. It's normal, you can't see it. So probably stroke windowing has happened on my phone. So something that maybe you can try, you take a picture, look in the phone, if you can't walk into the room of the CT scan, so you might see this. In fact, I was showing that to Sainak also the other day. So the, on, the, on the film, we cannot see it. So this phenomenon you all know, when you block MCA artery, the whole area become functionless. But in the middle, you see there's an infarcted area. If you keep the block maintained for the next few seconds or minutes or hours, you will see that the dead core expands to occupy the the rest of the threatened cerebral tissue. You all know this word penumbra is the threatened brain tissue that is uh, being threatened to die within the next few minutes. So the dead core expands to occupy the whole area affected. So the whole area becomes infarcted. So salvaging the penumbra is the main key thing that we are trying to do as uh, by identifying acute stroke as an emergency. So we have advised the community, the public to recognize stroke from home. We have been given mnemonics to recognize a stroke fast or be fast. And then there have been uh, clinical tools available in the emergency department for them to recognize a stroke. 
emergency department may not be very competent in differentiating and identifying strokes. And if you think there's a stroke, of course, next main thing is to salvage the penumbra. So reperfusion therapies are available, thrombolysis and thrombectomy. And certain patients may not be qualifying to reach, uh, receive these therapies, but still other factors like control of blood sugar, blood pressure, and maintaining the osmolality and treating the fever, all these things matters in salvaging the penumbra in all patients. This is the only FDA approved drug available for treatment of acute stroke, intravenous RTPA, Altiplase also. Uh, this is becoming an accepted standard practice world over now. Any patient who is coming with acute stroke within 4.5 hours uh, must be evaluated for this. And those who qualify after going through the protocol must receive this. And this can be administered in many hospitals. Now the CT scan is available throughout the country in many hospitals and a lot of neurology is also throughout the country now. Uh, and we know that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, from the beginning in 1995, when the first evidence came 26 years ago, uh, NINDS trial actually uh, beyond doubt proved that uh, uh, RTPA is effective within first three hours. And uh, nothing much has uh, developed beyond that as far as intravenous thrombolysis is concerned, except the fact that initial phase in the NIADS trial, we use uh, the clinical deficit uh, to find out how bad the, how, how severe the stroke is. And we used a clinical score called NIHS score, a National Institute of Health Sciences score. And when the score is less than four or more than 24, Generally, we did not thrombolyze. Less than four because it's a milder deficit. We don't want to give a dangerous drug for a milder deficit. When it's more than 24, we didn't give it because it can cause hemorrhage. So in between these two, we were giving. But now, even with less than four NIHS score, certain patients receive intravenous thrombolysis if that particular deficit is a significant one. Complete hemianopia, severe aphasia, visual inattention or any limb weakness, they're all going to be severe disabling ones. So even the NHS score is lower, still we go ahead with the thrombolysis. And depending on the patient's dexterity, still you might think to go ahead with the uh, thrombolysis. Number needed to, uh, sorry, benefit versus harm by giving IVRTPA. You can see the toll bars are benefit beneficial effects and the smaller ones are the harmful effects, ICHS. And on the X axis, the time, you can see the, uh, the earlier you do thrombolysis, the benefit is maximum and the harm is minimum. And within the first three hours, number needed to treat is eight. And three to 4.5 hours, number needed to become 14. So earlier you treat, the better you will be. This is in comparison to certain trials indicating coronary artery disease treatment with thrombolysis. Number needed to treat in some of the trials is 45. So this is very significant. So how do you do the thrombolysis? There are inclusion criteria. There are three of them. You must make sure that the patient has a stroke clinically. Otherwise, you're not going to do this. So you must have a measurable neurological deficit. And then patient has to be more than 18 years. And also patients should be within the window of 4.5 hours. So inclusion criteria, all of them are present. And there's a list of exclusion criteria. Our doctors go through and check them. So all uh, hemorrhagic complications that we are trying to rule out. Someone who had a recent surgery or things like that. And then we go to the clinical burden of neurological deficit, NIHS score. And aspect score is a CT. Uh, on this non-contrast CT, how much of infarcted area is there? Uh, so there are CT criteria, and we make sure that we do a blood sugar because hypoglycemia can cause focal deficits. In such an event, we don't want to thrombolyze, we want to correct the sugar and see whether it improves. And everything's okay, conducive for thrombolysis, we must check the blood pressure ourselves and satisfy that blood pressure is not more than 185 by 110. If that is the case, if it's higher, we must reduce it and then 
give the thrombolytics. And then we maintain the blood pressure at 180 by 105 if we thrombolyze. And the dose, I don't think you need to remember, it's, it's a bolus followed by infusion. This drug is given as a bolus followed by infusion. So we usually have two IV lines on either arm. We keep the infusion ready on one side and give the bolus to one arm and immediately start the infusion as a continuation after the bolus. So exclusion criteria are there. You can read up. I have taken this from up to date. Um, all of them are actually trying to prevent hemorrhagic complications. And NIHS score is uh, actually developed to assess the neurological deficit in a MCA distribution stroke. If you look at what is there, actually they have been doing it mainly for MCA distribution strokes. And uh, if you look at the NIHS distribution among reperfusion, reperfusion therapy candidates, you can see NIHS score on the x-axis and percentage of people on the y-axis. You see most of them have uh, lower NIHS score, less than 10. Uh, this is a major component of the NIHS because it's mainly, so most patients, about 80 to 90 percent, have small vessel occlusion. So uh, the generally, these strokes, ischemic strokes can be caused by small clots or large clots. It looks like uh, most of them have smaller clots, but about 10 percent or 15 percent will have large ones where it is blocking the main stem of the arteries. MCA at the beginning of the MCA artery. And aspect score is uh, on the non contrast uh, CT scan in the radi uh, radiology room. The radiologists do the stroke windowing and he takes two cuts one at the ganglionic level, the basal ganglia level, another at supra ganglionic level. And uh, there are defined 10 areas where it can infarct in the MCA distribution. So the score is 10 means there is no infarction. So you reduce one for each area that is infarcted. Generally in uh, most trials, they expect more than six. Uh, so aspect score is not commonly done in our setup, but something that we can do because non contrast CT sometimes we don't see the exact areas. And then CT criteria should be fulfilled. There should not be any hemorrhage. There can't be an established infarct. If the established infarct is there, whatever the duration they say, we are not going to thrombolyze. And uh, as I said, blood sugar and then blood pressure should be conducive. Now, most stroke happen in the morning. By the time they come in the morning, they say on waking up, I had a stroke. Then the duration of stroke, we do not know. Then we ask, when were you last known well? Did you get up in the night to the walk to the washroom or something? If he did that, that time is taken as the uh, time of onset for our calculation. So we don't say time of onset, we say last known well. So if that duration is less than 4.5 hours, we can work up for stroke. If that duration is more than 4.5 hours, is there a way that we can find out whether this patient is suitable for thrombolysis because most strokes happen in the morning. People have been looking for a method of finding out whether, whether there's an imaging technique to find out whether the patient is within 4.5 hours. Now, this is a MRI image. On the left-hand side, you see the diffusion weighted imaging showing the infarct. On the right-hand side, you see ADC map. These two images are usually coming hand in hand together. When you say diffusion restriction, you expect a hyper intensity in the diffusion, where you see on the left side, and you must have hypo intensity on the ADC map. Then only you can say there is diffusion restriction. That's diffusion restriction, which is there immediately after, um, within seconds or minutes after, uh, then after an infarct. So if you want to diagnose uh, infarct, diffusion images are the best. Now, looking at the diffusion and the flare images, you can see that on the diffusion image, this is done concurrently in acute stroke patient. You see the diffusion restriction on the uh, left-hand side image in this patient. On the right-hand side, the flare is normal. You don't see any flare hyperintensity. But given time, if you do another image after a while, you will see that the 
same area or a little larger than that, you will see flare hyper intensity also will come up. So it appears that flare hyper intensity takes a little longer to come up. So people have been looking at this flare changes over time. This the time is given in minutes here. Now the black area, actually the obvious flare lesion is there. And then subtle lesion and there's no lesion is white. So you see minimum flare lesion. You don't see much in up to 4.5 hours. Beyond that, you're going to see flare lesions coming up. And this diffusion flare mismatch. So you have the diffusion lesion, but flare lesion is not there. Probably patient is within 4.5 hours. So this had been used, diffusion flare mismatch had been used in few trials. On the top, you see the diffusion flare mismatch warranting for thrombolysis. And below images show that there is no diffusion flare mismatch. So they are not going to get the thrombolysis. So this uh, particular imaging technique had been used in Mr. Witness and Wake Up, the two trials. Another factor determining uh, the how fast the infarct evolve is the collaterals. This is something that you are born with. Some people are fortunate as far as strokes are concerned because uh, if you have good collateral supply, the the rate at which the infarct is going infarct evolve is slower. If your collaterals are not there, then very fast, the core will expand to occupy the whole penumbra. Uh, we have seen this phenomenon when people are doing thrombectomy. There was a large clot. Patient came with a hemiplegia, definite stroke, suitable for thrombectomy. And they did the CT angio. They went ahead with the uh, clot retrieval. Good flow was established after the procedure. They call it picky 2B3 flow is good. Um, this is something proportionate to TME flow in cardiac uh, thrombectomies. And, uh, but the patient did not improve. The reason is poor collateral supply. They were able to reperfuse, immediate endpoints are achieved. Good flow is restored, but still the patient did not improve. Now, there's so much of discussion going on about tenecteplase, which is already in use for cardiac patients. This is a genetically modified form of TPA, fibrin specific, half-life is longer, a oh, lot of uh, goods, good side uh, compared to RTPA, single bolus administration, um, half the price, but still not approved. Initial trials have shown non-inferiority or maybe superiority, but still we are waiting for larger trials to uh, tell us to make a change in practice. The practice has not changed. Having said that, certain uh, countries, certain uh, physicians, neurologists, strokeologists have been using this. Now about the timeline of various trials that has taken place over a couple of decades, you know about NINDS trial, which happens in 1995. That was a landmark trial. The first trial uh, uh, indicating that RTPA is effective within three hours beyond doubt. And people are wondering, maybe we are missing some patients. Maybe we must extend the time window beyond three hours. So the next trial comes in 2005, ECAS-3. Uh, they were assessing patients from 4.5 sorry, three to 4.5 hours, again proved beyond doubt that it's effective, except for people who are more than 80 years, there were two or three instances where you do not give, but otherwise it's effective up to 4.5 hours. So thrombolysis in place, it's a standard practice from 1995 or from the period that was coming in up to now, it's world over. Uh, various stroke, acute stroke units, now in Sri Lanka, Every place where the neurologists are, most places, thrombolysis is taking place. Some of the Finnish physicians also doing it. We must be very thankful then. 
so thrombolysis is taking place. I think anywhere where the CT scanners are there, someone should be doing this. But at the same time, we understand some of the clots are small, which is amenable by intravenous administration of a thrombolytic agent, but they may not act on the large clots. On your right hand side, large vessel occlusions. MCA territory starts with M1 and M2 section. If you have a clot there, maybe IVR TPA is not good enough to act there, or ICA clot, anterior cerebral artery clots, maybe basilar clots. So these large ones, probably we need to send a wire there and then extract it out, thrombectomy. We knew that and cardiologists were doing it. These are some of the thrombectomized uh, clots at various lengths. Cardiologists were doing all these interventional things. So people want to go in and grab this clot, take it out. Initial trials in 2013 was not conducive, not failing, didn't come to as change of practice. But 2015, there were landmark trials. I have put it in red. Mr. Clean was a forerunner there. And most patients were uh, recruited up to six hours where they suspected large vessel occlusion. So how do you find out large vessel occlusion in a patient who is having hemiplegia? If you do a CT angiogram, if you suspect large vessel occlusion, then you uh, 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 do a CT angio, you see the large vessel occlusion and the patient is taken for thrombectomy. There are entry criteria, inclusion criteria, and that was the results of the Mr. Clean. So there are two kinds of aspiration systems available for that. The aspiration system, penumbra aspiration system, they are with a negative pressure, they aspirate the clot. On the right-hand side, there's a stent retriever, there's a wire goes through the clot, and then they release the uh, net-like thing, the stent retriever, and then the clot becomes um, uh, entangled there, so you take the wire with the clot. Now, another concept here is uh, looking at the infarct volume in patients over time. Uh, we see some of them, the infarct volume rises very sharply. But in the initial phase, you have very little infarct volume, but some of them rises very sharply. Um, that's the uh, people with poor collaterals. But on the other hand, we see people having even up to 24 hours. The infarct volume is less than 50. Now we were doing all of them until six hours. We were limiting every acute treatment up to six hours, but probably there is still penumbra there in certain patients. Slow progresses because of the poor good collaterals. So maybe there's a place for thrombectomy even beyond six hours. So this is the reason why people plan all these trials, mainly the Dawn and Diffuse 3 trials. This came, uh, results came in 2018 and uh, these two trials were becoming landmark trials. They proved beyond doubt that uh, this is effective. The number needed to treat is even smaller than uh, thrombolysis, 2.8 in Dawn trial, and diffuse three so number needed to treat 3.6. This is to uh, get the disability score uh, to independency. Significant, but problem is large vessel occlusions are just 10% of the stroke patients. And out of them, you do the CT perfusion and see that uh, the volumes and, and uh, uh, mismatches are conducive. Only some of them will receive this. It's a CT perfusion, neuroradiology stuff. I'm not going to the details, but the neuroradiologist has to sit in front of the computer with visual mapping. You have to do certain things, little time consuming, and to get these all images indicating where the, how much of penumbra is there, how much of infarcted tissue is there. But now, that's what the end result of the uh, neuroradiologist's work. And now there are automated rapid software, which is actually artificial intelligence. You do the CT scanner. On your left-hand side, you see the infarcted area. On the right-hand side, you see the penumbra. So you assess the volumes from the computer. They give the results also. They calculate the mismatch volume and the mismatch ratio. It's a matter of decision-making, that's all. So the trial had various criteria, how much of uh, mismatch volume should be there, how much of mismatch ratio should be there to go ahead with the thrombectomy. And the neuroradiologist delay also was uh, taken off. 
a word about pfo am i within time uh, because we are when we whenever we get a patient with stroke ischemic stroke we always think ourselves what is the mechanism of stroke mostly atherothromboembolic but it may be cardioembolic it could be vasculitis thrombophilia many mechanisms may operate you look for everything clinically and with investigations you look for the mechanism of stroke end of the day sometimes you don't find anything most patients of course you will see the risk factors are there and you might see a left ventricular aneurysm or atrial fibrillation sometimes you don't find anything so they are categorized as cryptogenic stroke now then when you say cryptogenic strokes you have to be careful because uh, you must make sure that the echo had been done properly sometimes people can miss things in the echocardiogram carotids had been done properly so sometimes things can be missed so just because you say cryptogenic everything in the first turn everything becomes negative we should not accept it uh, because some of these cryptogenic strokes actually had cardiogenic embolism and carotid stenosis and so on so once you have adequately ruled out those things maybe you find a pfo a persistent foramen ovale patent foramen ovale which is actually a common thing 25% of the community will have this just because you see it it is not indicating that that is a cause but it could be the cause if it is the cause then you must close it now how are you going to find it people have been following these patients and uh, they have look at the demographic data of the people who develop strokes versus who do not develop strokes and develop a score a clinical tool which you can use a uh, risk of uh, risk of uh, paradoxical embolism score so from this you can take a decision whether this pfo is a pathologic pathogenic pfo or a, just a bystander pfo and always get the cardiologist to uh, decide on the pfo closure now sometimes we see large embolus causing stroke but there is no uh, cause found heart is normal there is no thrombophilia Uh, this group is named as embolic stroke of unclear source actually this is same as cryptogenic stroke uh, name has been changed but there are large strokes we don't see why this happened all the causes possible causes that you can investigate had been done nothing found and there were trials to look at whether uh, anticoagulation will be useful for them but those trials have not revealed any use of anticoagulation so we should not use anticoagulation on them but there is this new entity called atrial cardiopathy i'm sure some of you have heard which is detected by many means including an ecg showing a p wave terminal force in ecg lead one is increased i'm not expert in ecg a lot of experts on the audience this uh, there's a terminal downward deflection in the p wave that duration is prolonged and there are other things also now these patients when they do the echocardiogram sometimes they say Uh, atria looks like atrial fibrillation but the sign of patient is in sinus rhythm this patients have been uh, uh, exposed to 24 hour halter there is no if atrial fibrillation they have done 48 hours halter even loop recorders have been in so no if is found but there is this pathology happening in the atrial appendage so this is an event today that people are looking at um and also a word about acute stroke care unit um this had been repeatedly world over proven beyond doubt by isolating stroke patients to one geographic area and uh, making uh, available uh, all this uh, solving assessment protocols and uh, blood sugar screening dvt prophylaxis and so on uh, has a very good outcome as far as the 90 day stroke disability scores are concerned in fact there have been trials indicating that number needed to treat is 18 so significant less costly intervention is to have acute stroke in established and all stroke stroke patients being admitted to one geographic area and looked after by the dedicated team of doctors therapist with protocol driven management pathways and currently overseas we have acute stroke care units where all these patients are getting admitted to some uh, the local uh, area 
hospital and then when they need thrombectomy they are being transferred to a comprehensive stroke unit center for sri lanka probably the plan is to have one, one comprehensive stroke center in colombo um, probably at mulleria we are still uh, people are discussing about it but certainly in colombo because we have interventional radiology in colombo so colombo will be a comprehensive stroke unit doing everything but other units maybe they do the thrombolysis and then transfer the patient to the comprehensive stroke unit drip and shift to start the drip and then shift the patient to the comprehensive unit so in summary patients who are arriving this is very crowded i don't think you can see from far away if you have up to date you can get this from the up to date i have taken it from the up to date if the patient is within 4.5 hours all of them should be worked up for ivr tpa and people uh, who um, you are think there is large vessel occlusion they will undergo a ct angiogram and then followed by thrombectomy pathway people who are beyond 4.5 hours up to 24 hours we don't give ivr tpa but they are worked up for a large clots with a ct perfusion images ct angiogram and then they are taken for thrombectomy pathway people who are arriving after 24 hours standard evaluation and care so depending on the ct angiogram finding if the large vessel occlusion is there large artery occlusion is there less than 6 hours we followed the mr clean trial so uh, there is criteria I, i have not gone into the details of that 6 to 24 hours we follow the diffuse 3 and the dawn criteria um, and uh, stroke from posterior circulation with large artery occlusion basilar stroke those are very bad ones consider mechanical thrombectomy there's no trial data but people go and take it out so no cause found standard evaluation and a word about stroke rehabilitation the mrs score gradually comes down as they go on rehabilitation uh, improve the patient disability improves with time even if you don't give rehabilitation some amount of improvement can take place but if you rehabilitate them the improvement is you are going to get a, a long term disability level very very low level thank you very much thank you very much damini for that excellent update you covered the whole gamut of stroke care from uh, the initial nins trial up to now so thank you very much questions will be entertained at the end so we move on to the next talk and it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker dr manjula khaldera he is the consultant neurologist at teaching hospital anradhapura and he is also the present secretary of the association of sri lankan neurologists and today manjula is going to talk to us on phenomenology of movement disorders a broad perspective another very important area in neurology movement disorders so over to manjula Uh, thank you, Dr. Seneca, uh, for that kind introduction, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Rajapaksa, the President of Sri Lankan College of Physicians, and then the Council for inviting me for this talk. Uh, my file is a little bulky because a lot of videos in it, so uh, please bear with me like, until it's saved in the computer. Um, and i would like to thank a few people uh, before this talk until sort of it's get uh, uh, saved uh, i would like to thank uh, my uh, trainer professor ranjani gamage who was always sort of have an enthusiasm for the movement disorders and who was always encouraged us to take video clips of the movement disorders uh, and those days we didn't have uh, good uh, camera phones the small phones didn't have good camera so we are supposed to sort of carry a small clip on camera uh, formal camera uh, along with us when we are seeing movement disorders and then today morning my uh, laptop crashed because of poor storage and i would like to thank dr himal jalpa who is here who's helped us with the restoration of the file okay going to the topic uh, phenomenology of the movement disorder uh, when you are talking movement disorders it's a little different uh, to any other neurological disorder that uh, we usually sort of approach other neurological disorders usually you uh, try to localize the syndrome where it is happening and then trying to find the pathology what kind of a pathology is it but in movement disorders you trying to find out uh, what exactly 
the the phenomenon uh, what, what what how do you sort of trying to uh, recognize a pattern and then trying to find what kind of uh, a disease which could present in that phenomenon so it's very much important uh, to find out uh, the phenomenon so it's always observation uh, careful observation with little knowledge uh, about uh, what is the type of movement even if you are an eye person you you would be able to appreciate what kind of a movement whether it's a rhythmic movement or whether it's arrhythmic uh, the tremors hemifacial spasms are slightly rhythmic uh, whether the movement is uh, sustained or is it a non sustained uh, mostly dystonias are having uh, sustained movements uh, whether the movements are always they are continuous or whether they are coming once in a while or sort of uh, paroxysmal uh, such as ticks uh, with prolonged observation you may do various sort of maneuvers to sort of make it more prominent or less prominent or diminish whether it is present at rest or in any particular action make it worse um, or whether there is any pattern or non pattern thing so those are the observations that you are going to uh, do uh, movement disorders can be voluntary of course they are not considered as disorders most of the functional movement disorders uh, can be voluntary we are not going to talk on the functional movement disorders today the involuntary ones which easily can be categorized as reduced movements or paucity of movements or which we call technically as hypokinetic movement disorders or increased movements or more movements or we can call them hyperkinetic movements and some people would like to consider ataxia also sort of comes with abnormal movement sometimes under the involuntary movement disorders. We are not going to talk about the ataxia, which is usually uh, cerebellar disorders. We are going to talk today on hypo and hyperkinetic movement disorders. Now, first, the hypokinetic movement disorders, uh, where the movements are less, or we call them bradykinesia or bradykinetic or akinetic where the movements are less. Usually you see the hypokinetic movement disorders in Parkinsonism, you may see Parkinson's disease, uh, which is idiopathic Parkinson's disease, or Parkinsonism, other syndromes like Parkinson's plus syndromes, like progressive supranuclear palsy, multisystem atrophy or CBD, where you may have atypical features. Uh, in the Parkinsonism, you all know the, the mnemonic, the trap, which is tremor, rigidity, akinesia, and postural instability. Uh, tremor, we are discussing in the hyperkinetic movement disorder, uh, but So uh, rigidity, uh, um, it's uh, something uh, which you all sort of learn in the medical school, which is uh, the, the, the resistance to the passive movement. You can see the resistance to the passive movement in the spasticity as well. So how you need to differentiate how uh, the rigidity differentiate from the spasticity. Spasticity, it is, um, it is a volume depend, uh, velocity dependent, uh, that depend on the velocity, the spasticity increase. Uh, but rigidity, it doesn't uh, increase with the, the velocity of the movement. Uh, and it's always sort of the same with whatever the velocity. Um, so simple increase in the resistance is called lead pipe uh, uh, rigidity. You all familiar with lead pipe rigidity. And when it's associated with the tremor, superimposed with the tremor, you call it cogwheel, uh, uh, cogwheeling phenomenon in rigidity. Uh, the akinesia and bradykinesia usually observed in patients in this video uh, will uh, try to demonstrate sorry uh, the, you can see this man is having a mask like face his movements are extremely slow uh, and uh, this is the alternate finger tapping you can do alternate uh, movements of uh, fist uh, closing and opening or pronation and supination of the hand or you can do toe tapping you can do heel tapping uh, you are trying to observe whether there's any slowness to the movement. And usually they are asymmetric um, in Parkinson's disease. Uh, you are always looking at the speed of the movement and uh, as well as the amplitude of the movement. Usually these people who are uh, having either low speed 
or low amplitude, uh, you, they don't be able to sort of open up widely, or they may be having both. And all, all, also having the postural disturbance, you are always familiar with this two posture. And then you, are, you can check the postural instability by retropulsion, but you have to make sure that the examiner is not injured as well as the patient not injured by this test, the pull test. Patient is supposed to sort of keep uh, the feet, uh, take about three steps and then uh, less than three steps, you have to sort of stabilize yourself. Uh, you, you always sort of better do that in a corridor, but if the patient comes and say, that patient presence is recurrent and falls, better not to uh, test this because all these patients come with the postural instability, you better avoid uh, this for the safety reasons. The hyperkinetic movement disorders, uh, which, is, which are the movement disorders where the movements are in excess, uh, the tremor, dystonia, chorea, athetosis, balismus, myoclonistic, stereotypy, akathisia. We are going to discuss these uh, 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 with time, with, move, with, with video help. Tremors. Tremors are defined as uh, an involuntary, rhythmic, oscillatory movement of a body part. Usually they are due to uh, the contraction of agonist and antagonist muscles uh, intermittently, which makes an involuntary uh, rhythmic movement. It is the most common movement disorder. Uh, and uh, we may get physiological tremors and the physiological, uh, pathological tremors. In physiological tremors, usually they are seen in the limbs, commonly in the hands. Uh, and uh, when uh, the, the body is unsupported, which is usually kept on a posture, and it's usually not visible or minimally visible and usually not symptomatic but they can be enhanced by fatigue going anxiety. Most of the time you may encounter a person who's been referred to you because it's not a problem for the patient mostly, or it may, the patient may be referred to you when the patient is found in a, some kind of assessment, maybe a work related assessment or a driving assessment, somebody has not had a tremor, and then you, the patient may be referred to you, whether this patient, what, what, what this patient is having, and the patient is have, having any, contraindication to driving kind of thing. Usually that is um, a physiological tremor, which could be worsened by uh, fatigue or anxiety. Usually you don't need treatment unless patient is bothered. Pathological tremor, usually visible and symptomatic. And uh, uh, the, the sort of extensive classification of the phenomenology of the pathological tremor, which is not the scope of the talk today. We are trying to describe today the tremor characteristics where the tremor could be described according to the part of the, the body part, which is involved, uh, whether it's involved in the hand, the head, the neck, uh, or, and, the, and the tremor frequency, and most importantly, the activation conditions, uh, what kind of um, uh, maneuvers will accentuate uh, the tremor, tremor. So the activation uh, uh, of tremor could be done uh, in rest and in the in a particular action. The action could be uh, postural, where you maintain a certain posture, or some action, a kinetic. We usually do the same manual like that you all do for the finger nose test, or it could be an action of contraction, uh, a sustained contraction, which we call isometric contraction of a limit, which we call isometric tremor. Uh, in the kinetic. Uh, when you are doing the finger nose test, if the tremor is not a throughout in the same amplitude, same frequency, you call it simple kinetic tremor. If the amplitude and the frequency get worse towards the target, you call it intentional tremor, commonly used in cerebellar disorders. Or if a particular task makes the patient tremor worse, um, people have. Uh, sort of primary writing tremors where they don't get tremor in any other activity, but only during the writing. Those are, those are task specific kinetic tremors. So you can't remember all these things. I think a most simplified way is to classify it as whether it's a rest, whether it's a postural or whether it is kinetic. Now the rest tremor, which is uh, defined as when your body part is completely relaxed and supported. If the, if the patient is having a hand tremor, you, you usually sort of keep the hand uh, on, the, on the thighs and relaxed. Uh, or if it is happening in the head, you ask the patient to head supported to a backrest or a wall. And then you demonstrate the tremor. Uh, these tremors uh, diminishes or abolishes with action, at least transiently. 
Sometimes you may see the Parkinson's patient can have a rest tremor on the hand. And then when you get the patient to uh, uh, do a certain posture, the tremor diminishes. And then it may start again, which is called re-emergent tremor. So, so this uh, tremor uh, can be diminished um, or at least transiently diminished with the action. So that is one one point uh, in the rest tremor. And, and these uh, rest, tremor, rest tremor could be increased or accentuated by um, mental stress. So if the patient comes and complains you that the patient has tremor, but when you get the patient to rest, doesn't elicit the tremor, you can uh, give them a mental task, maybe something like counting backward from 20, 20, 19, 18, something like that, that give a mental stress and then that may demonstrate uh, the, 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 the tremor. Or oh, you may get the patient to walk. You, you have seen patients uh, with the Parkinson's disease when they're walking, their pill rolling tremor appears. Or oh, if they perform uh, a, a large uh, sort of big amplitude body, body movement on the opposite limb, uh, you get the tremor accentuated on the, on the resting limb. Uh, this commonly occurs in uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, the rest tremor is, uh, uh, and, and uh, you can see it in advanced uh, essential tremor as well. Uh, never it happens in other tremors like dystonic tremors. Uh, the tremor frequency, uh, we usually sort of don't take it very seriously because uh, it's not mostly helpful. If you want to accurately measure it, there are accelerometers, uh, there are uh, smartphone devices with accelerometer apps, uh, or which has a motion transducer technology, or there is uh, objectively you can do it by electromyography, surface electromyography by the neurophysiologist. Uh, they often categorized as less than four hertz, four to eight hertz, eight to 12 hertz, and more than 12 hertz. It's not very help helpful because most of the tremors are between four to eight hertz. But uh, sometimes there are extreme. Uh, uh, Frequency tremors are there, like myorrhythmia, and some palatal tremors, usually extremely slow, like less than four hertz. Uh, primary orthostatic tremor, where the patients get tremor only while standing up, which can be easily uh, uh, detected by the clinical history and then the surface electro, uh, electromyography, which is more than 12 hertz. And then the physiological tremors are between eight to 12 hertz. Now we are going to see a rest tremor. You can see this lady, the previous lady, previous gent also had a tongue tremor. This lady is having a mouth opening and closing tremor and a tongue tremor. And you can look at her hand. The hand is resting on her lap. And then the legs, uh, all these body parts are tremulous and she's having a rest tremor. And, and she's, she's having a, a mask-like phase, is predikinesia. So you know this patient has. Idiopathic pulse. She tried to talk to you, and then the tremor disappeared uh, during that action of the mouth. She, she tried to talk, and then the tremor disappears. Uh, right. Yeah. So this is Parkinson's disease. The essential tremor is another sort of common tremor, common uh, tremor disorder, um, which uh, you need to under, understand and diagnose because it, you may see those patients very commonly, other than Parkinson's disease. It's an isolated tremor syndrome usually bilateral uh, upper limb, uh, they, they usually sort of having an action tremor. You get the patient to do a action postural, uh, you get the tremor accentuated. To diagnose essential tremor, you need to have tremor more than three years duration. The tremor may or may not involve the other locations like uh, they may be having head tremor, voice tremor, uh, they can have um, uh, the lower limbs as well involved. Usually, uh, the essential tremor syndrome should not have other neurological diagnosis such as dystonia, ataxia, or Parkinson's. So you have to exclude all these things to make an essential tremor diagnosis. Once essential, essential tremor diagnosis, you treat with uh, beta blockers uh, or, or primidone. Um, uh, when you have additional neurological symptoms uh, like mild ataxia or mild dystonia, which doesn't significant uh, enough to diagnose ataxia syndrome or a dystonia syndrome, but there's mild symptoms, you call it essential tremor plus syndrome. And uh, it's important to exclude the other tremors from diagnosing or labeling as essential tremors. So there are exclusion criteria. If you have isolated head or vocal uh, tremor, 
uh, without involving the hands, then you don't call it uh, essential tremor. The orthostatic tremor where you get the leg tremor uh, when you're standing up, uh, that is an exclusion criteria. task specific tremors like the primary writing tremor when you're getting the tremor only while writing is an exclusion. And uh, then sudden onset and stepwise deterioration is not the typical feature of essential tremor. Usually they have uh, about 50% can have a family history. Usually they're alcohol responsive. So people would like to take alcohol uh, to uh, negotiate, uh, uh, to get well with their tremors. So it's sort of uh, 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 can be seen in people as well. Right, so this is an es essential tremor where you can see a very mild rest tremor. So in advanced space, you can get that. When you're doing the posture, you can get, you will notice that the patient is having, having tremor. And there's a simple kinetic tremor as well. Throughout the movement, it's not uh, intentional. It doesn't sort of uh, worsen at the, towards the target. It's the same frequency. And when you try to get the Archimedes spiral, we call this Archimedes spiral. It's very, very characteristic in essential tremor. We, people, people find it extremely difficult to do. So most of the essential tremors might come and say to you that they are find extremely terrible uh, at the banks, especially when somebody is looking at you to sort of sign and withdraw money. So that's something uh, very, very troubling. And most of the people find it difficult to pour something into a jar or sort of handling a tray or getting a sauce, sauce with, a, with a cup uh, or shaving their moustache or beard would be very, very troublesome. Now, this is another different tremor, which is called Holmes tremor. She has extremely... Uh, high amplitude tremors in legs, uh, in arms, uh, and uh, the left side is very violent. Um, and and uh, this patient is extremely difficult to get uh, to do the finger nose test because uh, she injure her face uh, like if she want to get the finger nose test with the left side. The, the Holmes tremor uh, is due to a, a, a lesion in the red nucleus. Uh, this girl had uh, multiple sclerosis uh, with uh, lesions everywhere, including in the brainstem. Uh, now uh, we'll go to dystonia. Dystonia is characterized by uh, sustained or intermittent muscle contractions causing abnormal, often repetitive movements, postures or both. So the, the most characteristic thing is they, they, they can have uh, sustained uh, uh, postures plus movements uh, or twisting like uh, postures. Uh, they're typically patterned uh, and uh, maybe tremulous. Uh, and in that, in that situation, you call them dystonic tremor. Usually, they initiated or worsened by voluntary action. So sometimes the patient may not have the dystonia, but when you get them to do a particular action, uh, the dystonia get manifest and associate with overflow muscle activation. What do you mean by that is if the patient having a dystonia in a particular group of muscle, there are other muscles which are not responding or not uh, contributed to that particular dystonic movement also get activated. We can see them in the videos. And um, uh, mostly associated with postures, but some are not, like blepharospasms and laryngeal dystonias. We are going to see the videos. And then the mirror dystonia. What do, you, what do you mean by mirror dystonia is when you have a particular dystonia in one limb, um, if you get the other limb to do the particular action, the dystonia manifests in the affected limb. We, we are going to show the videos. And then the alleviative maneuvers, uh, which we are called sensory tricks or just antagonist, is another feature of dystonia. Um, you have to differentiate the pseudo dystonias, the dystonia like syndromes, which are not movement disorders, because they also mimic uh, dystonic, uh, where you maintain certain movements or postures or spasms, but not dystonia. Uh, people can have tics, which are looks like dystonic. Or people can have torticollis, head tilts, uh, retrocollis, uh, or anterocollis due to various uh, other pathologies like vestibulopathy. If you have a balance problem, people can, uh, or hearing problem, you can uh, keep one, one ear in the front because that's the sort of uh, the dominant ear. 
uh, or uh, maybe uh, if you have a squint uh, like trochlear palsy, you may have a head tilt. So you have to exclude other possibilities. Uh, congenital muscular torticollis, scoliosis, you can have various posturing on the back, dupuytren's contractions. There are various things which may mimic dystonias. Now, this lady uh, is uh, having a, a, a tremor in the head. Uh, and um, um, this is uh, one of uh, the common uh, dystonic uh, tremor that most of the neurologists would encounter with. You can see that her sternomastoid, the, the, the scalene muscles, the levator scapular muscles are very, uh, 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 very prominent and uh, thickened. Uh, and those are the muscles that we do inject uh, when these patients uh, come with uh, dystonic tremor. Uh, uh, now, now you can see that uh, when this patient uh, get to walk also, uh, uh, that the, the head tremor is being demonstrated. Now, this guy uh, has more severe, uh, severe form of dystonic tremor. You can see that his head is tilted tilt to the left side, which is called latricollis, and then slightly turned to the left side, which is called torticollis. Uh, so he finds it extremely difficult to keep the head straight. Uh, and, and he can easily look towards his left side, but he trying to look to the right side. It's extremely difficult. This is his demonstrating the gesture antagonist. Where are you trying to do a sensitive trick, manual? He's just touching his uh, scalp. He doesn't forcefully touching his sort of antagonized action. And then uh, that makes his head straight, which is called a sensory trick. Uh, and again, it, it, it gets back. Now, this patient was injected uh, and now you can see how he is uh, in the second video. He, he he's reasonably better than he was, and he's able to uh, uh, he's able to sort of keep slightly head, and he can sort of uh, bend the head to the other side as well. This is after one week of botulinum toxin injection in in in, in cervical dystonia, and they have associated pain because of this severe muscle contraction, and then the pain is also something which get better with the injection. And this is another dystonic uh, dystonia, which is a focal dystonia happening in the uh, happening in the uh, uh, eyes, uh, in the uh, extracellular muscles where the eye the, the, the uh, eyes become uh, blinking. Uh, and this patient has uh, uh, blepharospasms, especially when talking. He didn't have any spasms in the eyelids until he started talking, and then and then uh, you can see now when he's talking, he gets. Uh, uh, bilateral eye blinking and it's a, a social embarrassment for the patient because when he start talking, uh, he, he gets a eyes blinked. And when you get uh, additional syndromes, uh, now the other guy on the right side, uh, he, he has uh, uh, involuntary jaw movements and involuntary platysma. Then uh, you can see his mouth is opening, which is called jaw opening dystonia. And then so if his mouth is moving towards the, the lower jaw is moving towards either side because of the pterygoid action. Uh, jaw opening also due to lateral pter pterygoids. Sometimes the jaw get closed due, due to the, the masseter. And then along with that, he get the blepharospasms as well, which we call a rare um, dystonic syndrome, uh, which is called the Meek syndrome. All these patients could be helped by uh, the botulinum toxin uh, when you identified the dystonic muscle and in the injecting the correct muscle. The guy uh, on your left, uh, is having a, a lingual dystonia or a, which you call tongue protrusion dystonia. He has difficulty keeping the tongue inside the mouth and is always protruding the tongue out of the mouth. So it's very difficult when this guy starts uh, eating uh, the, the, the food uh, sort of uh, pressures uh, or uh, uh, he, he can't solo, the, the, the normal tongue movement of the soloing doesn't take place. So it's extremely uh, strenuous uh, part for him to... Uh, Solo his food. Uh, we injected uh, to the genioglossus, the tongue muscle, with botulinum toxin, and he got better. Uh, this uh, chap uh, had dystonia since childhood. Uh, it was uh, the initially uh, happened with difficulty in walking. Now it involved the all body parts of the 
uh, uh, the neck, the hand, and the, the it's kind of a generalized dystonia. We don't have the genetic facilities. Uh, we didn't have the genetic facility that time. So we think it's a possible uh, DYT1 syndrome, or it has been labeled as a dystonic cerebral palsy. We don't know without genetic whether it is uh, uh, that. But then the progression with time may favor a, a genetic diagnosis, although he didn't have any family history. Now, this is a focal dystonia, which we call writer's cramp, which is a, 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 a very a, a significant dystonic syndrome. You can see that uh, on to your left, uh, the patient's thumb is uh, uh, flexing, uh, the distal phalanx is flexing so that he can't hold the pen with the thumb. Uh, you can see that uh, the thumb is going inward and then uh, he, it doesn't help. So he has to uh, maneuver the pen with some alternate uh, movement uh, to hold the pen to uh, get him right. So uh, in the other video, we can demonstrate the mirror movement where you get the same patient to write with the left hand. And then you, you see uh, or you observe the right thumb. Um, now, now, now his thumb is getting um, uh, uh, flexed. You, you, you will observe that the thumb, uh, the distal phalanx get uh, flexed uh, with time. So that is, uh, which we call the mirror movement, uh, which is important to recognize because that is the dystonic movement uh, that this patient ha has uh, uh, difficulty with writing. So if you know what is abnormal movement and which muscle, which cause in now this patient, the distal thumb flexes by the flexor pollicis longest muscle. So you can easily identify this muscle and inject that muscle with botulinum toxin and they get better. So these patients usually come, if they come closer to the exam, it's a bit a tricky thing because uh, sometimes if you inject a wrong muscle, um, uh, that may create problem with the writing. But uh, if you properly uh, evaluate uh, what is the abnormal uh, dystonic muscle, and then if you inject, uh, you can overcome uh, the problem and help them. Okay, let's talk about uh, atitosis chorean uh, balism or balismus, uh, which is a spectrum of disorder where uh, the, the uh, atitosis is very slow writhing movements, and then the chorea is sort of more generalized, and then Balismus is more violent form. So chorea, chorea is, uh, chorea means dance. It's uh, irregular, it's unpredictable, it's brief, jerky, fidgety movements that are usually of low amplitude. And uh, they happen in the random muscles and at random times uh, with uh, activity in random distribution. They can flow from one body part to the another. And uh, usually they, they are semi-purposeful or quasi-purposeful because they are involuntary and that make uh, people embarrassed. So they're trying to uh, pretend as if that movement has happened for a particular purpose like. Uh, and they can be uh, localized, segmental or generalized. Uh, now, this girl, you may see that she's, uh, 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 she's young and uh, she has involuntary movements in the hands. Uh, and then in the neck and in the legs, she can't stand, sit still. Um, and so this is a long video. Sorry, uh, I might not be able to play the entire thing. Uh, uh, she, she had a pseudonym scoria, she had rheumatic carditis, uh, so she responded to haloperidol. Uh, let's see this guy, um, he, he has again uh, chore movements uh, and then uh, he can't stand still, you know, you can see that he's like dancing like um, and his education is abnormal. Uh, it was sort of throughout uh, since his childhood. Uh, so we scanned him in the brain. Uh, that was a classical uh, uh, iron accumulation syndrome, which we call pantothenes kinase, uh, which uh, uh, in the MRI scan, we saw uh, a particular sign called eye of the tiger. So we thought that he has, all the genetics are not confirmed. Uh, we thought he has a hollow burden spatch disease. Okay. The chorea classification, I'm not going into in detail. In young people, you can see more uh, rheumatic chorea. 
uh, and all the people you get more heterodegenerative conditions like Huntington's chorea and uh, various drugs like levodopa uh, can give rise to uh, choreic movements as well. Athetosis is a slow continuous writhing movement we discuss, uh, uh, which usually associated with chorea, we call it choreathetosis. Uh, balismus or balismum, balism, uh, commonly seen in people with uh, uh, subthalamic nuclei or striatal infarctions, uh, you call, call uh, usually after stroke, or you may see it after uh, hyperglycemia, honk, you can get uh, uh, this uh, and uh, it depend on the limb involvement. If it's one limb involved, you can get uh, uh, monobalism. Uh, if you get uh, one half of the body involved, you call it hemibalism. Uh, if you get bilateral side involved, you can call it uh, bibalism. Uh, the myoclonus is a brief shock like uh, muscle jerk. Uh, they can be arrhythmic or they can be sometimes rhythmic, like in hemifacial spasms. They can have focal, segmental, multifocal, or generalized involvement. Usually, the myoclonus are synchronous. That means all limbs happening together, jerky, but sometimes they can be asynchronous as well. Myoclonus can be seen spontaneously without any activity, but sometimes they can be stimulated uh, by various actions, like which we call action myoclonus, which are usually seen in people who have hypoxic anoxic encephalopathy. You call them Lance Adams syndrome. And sometimes they can be reflex. You can call them. Uh, reflex like similar sensitive myoclonus. Um, uh, with the anatomical involvement, you can call, categorize them as cortical, subcortical, segmental, or proprio-spinal. Now, this lady has jerky movements in her hands. You can see them; they are very jerky. Uh, and and uh, uh, when when she holds her hand as well, uh, you may see it's tremulous, but then the other hand goes jerky. Uh, this girl had a complex phenomena. This myoclonus, we try to. Uh, uh, she had a, a syndrome called corticobasal syndrome, a Parkinson's plus syndrome. Uh, and then apart from that, we did uh, uh, thyroid peroxidase antibody. So she became positive for the high thyroid peroxidase antibodies as well, which is we call uh, the Hashimoto's encephalopathy. But then we treated with the steroids. She didn't make a marked improvement. So we thought it could be an innocent bystander, but she had this corticobasal syndrome. Now, this guy may, most of the people, especially uh, people who are in the uh, uh, medical wards, see that uh, you can recognize what kind of uh, medical history is having, having his uh, having a, uh, a, a, a AVF fistula on the, on the left arm, and you, you can see that he's having a renal phasis and his myoclonic and that is a metabolic myoclonus due to end stage renal failure. And these patients, when they have a renal replacement therapy, uh, hemodialysis, their myoclonus get better. Ticks, uh, another common movement disorder, they are intermittent, repetitive, stereotype movements. They can have motor or vocal ticks, uh, usually involved in the the normal agonist and antagonist muscle, muscle involvement. Uh, they vary severity over time uh, and uh, usually preceded by uncomfortable feeling uh, or a sensory urge uh, that you need to perform the tick. And then once you perform the tick, uh, you get relieved uh, comfortable, but uh, they get the urge again and again. Uh, the ticks can be abrupt. That means very brief or, or they can be very slow or prolonged. Uh, they can be simple, simple motor ticks, simple vocal ticks, or they can be complex motor and complex vocal ticks. Uh, often these pa patients can suppress their tics. They, if you ask them to suppress it, they can voluntarily suppress it uh, and you can easily distract them. Uh, and sometimes if you suggest, uh, the tics become very prominent as well. So they're very, very suggestible. Now this chap uh, is having uh, Gilas dole Tourette syndrome. Uh, he has vocal tics uh, and then he has motor tics involved in the face, the neck, you can see he's hiccuping. He has sort of a diaphragm ticks as well. Uh, and then he has a, a sort of a monophonic uh, uh, syllabic um, motor ticks. So he's extremely embarrassed. Now it's not sco schooling because of uh, this uh, disorder and being uh, bullied by uh, his friends. Um, right, so the take home message, uh, we have not discussed several other uh, hypermotor, uh, so hyperkinetic uh, motor disorders because of the limited time. Um, in movement disorders, 
Phenomenology helps to recognize the syndrome. So it's important to observe the patient uh, carefully and try to describe uh, the phenomenon. Mostly it's a pattern recognition. Uh, so the careful observation is the key. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Manjula, for that excellent uh, comprehensive lecture. I think uh, when it comes to movement disorders, it's very challenging unless you identify which type of movement disorder you can't proceed. So you, uh, in a very extensive manner, showed importance and also showed the junior doctors how these conditions present. So we move on to the next talk. And uh, it, may, uh, it, it will be given by Dr. Dilum Paliogur again, consultant neurologist uh, teaching hospital, Kurnagala. Uh, Dilum has special interest in headache disorders. And today he's going to talk to about, us about headache syndromes, the common and not so common. Um, thank you very much for those kind words of introduction. Um, the, I'm going to talk about the headache syndromes, which are common and uncommon. Dr. Kishara uh, selected this topic, uh, absolutely cover the entire spectrum of headache disorders. Um, it's a, so my plan is actually to discuss the classification in brief and identify the common types and discuss some of the management steps of common headache types and go into uncommon uh, headache types. Um, uh, there are a lot, actually, I'm going to choose a few to discuss. Uh, so international classification of headache disorders, version three, the beta version, uh, which came out 2013, and then uh, still in, it is in use. Uh, we divide um, broadly into three categories, primary headaches, secondary headaches, and uh, painful cranial neuropathies. So um, the, the common types are actually in the primary headaches, where which we cannot find the exact etiology to explain the headache disorders. Uh, there are pathology, but uh, it's not identifiable exact pinpoint etiology. So migraine is a top one and the tension type headache. Um, some people argue like what is more common, which is tension type or migraine type uh, and trigeminal autonomic uh, cephalagia. We, we call them a tax head, tax headache. And then uh, another primary headache disorders. And uh, out of secondary headaches, uh, there are attributable etiology to explain the headaches, which are um, uh, mostly uh, comes with the red flag signs, some sort of a focal neurological signs, some sort of a disability, uh, all this. Uh, this category is a dangerous type of headaches. Um, you have to do something, otherwise uh, the patient is in danger. Um, third category is actually uh, uh, mostly pain syndromes of uh, face. So you get um, uh, trigeminal neuralgias and other related causes. Uh, talk about the most commonest type is uh, uh, tension type headache, which I believe the tension type headache, uh, which almost every one of us had had it before. And the migraine headaches is all, also very common. It's actually the sixth commonest disorder in the world, it's come according to WHO. Eh? Um, so uh, it's quite common if you take uh, like a, a female, like a trend, as about 20% of uh, female would have a, a migraine tendency. About uh, 10 to 12% of male would have a migraine tendency. So that's quite a lot. Uh, so out of tax, I'm going to discuss cluster headaches and hemicranial headaches. So uh, what is migraine actually? It's, it's, a, it's again a pattern that you can see uh, when you are describing, uh, when, when a patient is describing a uh, migraine, uh, then they will talk about this episodic headache types, which probably has an onset during the school time. Um, usually uh, just before the all levels time, like uh, around when they are at 14, 15 years, uh, most, most of the patients will have a uh, migraine. Uh, onset of that age. Um, so uh, some people, they, they have a migraine with aura and then uh, some most wouldn't describe aura. And, but pe people with migraine with aura also wouldn't have migraine with aura all the time. They might have the mi non, mi migraine headaches without aura, 
and sometimes occasionally comes with a um, significant aura. So, so um, typically a migraine attack would last uh, way beyond four hours, up to about 72 hours. And beyond 72 hours, it's called a status migraine. That can go up to about seven days. Uh, however, this uh, duration is again uh, in the individual patient, it can be different. For example, uh, we have seen a shorter duration of headaches, especially the pediatric group, that could be even less than one hour. Um, So uh, there are migraine variants um, and brain stem with, uh, you know, hemiplegic migraine, retinal migraine, uh, all that, but they are like a very rarity. And uh, mostly, I would say sometimes as, uh, something like a hemiplegic migraine, um, certain times they extremely can be confused with a stroke. And then, um, so it is actually uh, uh, certain things are better not to know rather than know. <laughs> Uh, because you don't want to miss a stroke. Um, uh, typically, uh, auras are uh, sensory auras, uh, mostly like a visual auras. And then uh, uh, they can have uh, sensory, uh, uh, sensory uh, symptoms uh, coming in the face and the arms. I will describe in the later slide uh, more in detail. And then the chronic migraines, uh, usually we have, uh, most, most of the time they, they have headaches. Like for example, more than 15 days per month, uh, they, uh, somebody has a headache with migraine uh, features in it, more than eight, uh, eight days. So we would call them as a chronic migraine. Uh, according to age distribution, can you see this? This uh, we see it common in the th 30 to 50 years of age and it goes down and the women uh, has more incidence of migraine than the men. Um, so uh, if untreated, uh, as, it, as I told you, that can be, uh, can, can, can have a prolonged attacks up to about uh, even 72 hours. And then how would they uh, describe the pain would be like, a, it's a usually unilateral headache, unilateral onset headache. So it doesn't necessarily be contained into the uh, single side. It can be um, spread into the other side in a while. So, so when you are asking the history, it's always asking how how is the onset? Where you get the on uh, at the onset? Did you, did you get the head pain in the one side only, or in the both side at once? So uh, usually it's a unilateral onset, but secondarily can be uh, have a like a whole a pain in the whole head. Um, and then uh, that would accommodate with the nausea in most people um, uh, because uh, uh, it's activation of the brain stem due to the um, trigeminal inputs, uh, area, area posthema, and then it result in vomiting in certain individuals. And they have an increased uh, light sensitivity and sound sensitivity. So they tend to stay away from the sound and the light during an attack. So um, when you are taking down the history of the patient, uh, what you need to see with this kind of a, a headache history, the pattern is very important. Uh, onset of uh, onset of the age is important. So they, they described it. It's, uh, they have been very infrequent attacks and when it's not treated and then it goes on uh, getting more frequent and prolonged attacks and worse attacks. And until they become, um, at a certain point, they become uh, uh, features of chronic migraine. Um, so this is the, uh, the, the famous aura that they described. It's a, it's a kind, of, kind of a scotoma, and then it has a, like a wavy uh, border, which has a glittery uh, quality. And then they, so a lot of people would have it, a lot of people would draw it for you if you ask them. Uh, so the sensory pattern of uh, migraine aura, uh, mostly the face, a lower face, and the distal arms, uh, so in, including the hands and the forearms. So uh, the, the, this is uh, quite common, actually, when you ask them. However, uh, the real motor weakness is not there. So I mean, a lot of people would get confused. Now, uh, if say, for example, now uh, 
so when you even when they have sensory symptoms uh when you objectively check their muscle powers they are hardly in weak weakness you don't get weakness frank weakness with uh, migraine or as so just a merely a sensory symptom um so um, a lot of people would talk about the menstrual migraines so uh, this is how it goes like the this a uh, lot of correlation between the hormonal peaks and their um uh, the the date of their cycle so uh, the migraine tend to become very uh, very uh, frequent uh, just before the menstruation and the first few days of the menstruation and then uh, with the pregnancy um it changes for example like uh, um uh, patients with the migraine with aura uh, they would have a similar incident or more incident during their pregnancy but common migraine migraine without aura they tend to resolve during their pregnancy after the first trimester um however uh, there's a tendency to get get it back uh, close to their delivery time this where you get the referrals from the vogs uh, saying that the patient has a headache and then the patient patient's poa 38 weeks plus what should we do and all that stuff so um you need to examine them carefully exclude some focal neurology exclude uh, central venous sinus thrombosis and all that but uh, uh, there is this pattern when you ask them like in the previous time like even before the pregnancy they would describe migraines and then to get even less after menopause however they they peak again during the menopausal time that is also important to remember um so the chronic migraine is actually a uh, episodic migraine in transformation uh, when it is not treated and then a lot of people would end up in uh, chronic migraine status uh, so uh, uh, the transformation of to, to chronic migraine uh, when you have like high baseline frequency like when you people like a lot of incidents like a lot of frequency initially they they, they end up in chronic migraine if not treated and then uh, when they start using a lot of medication uh painkillers and that is also a signal that they are going to end up in chronic migraine uh when they have a lot of uh, nausea and uh, vomiting features and other secondary things uh, for example obesity snoring issues uh, obstructive sleep apnea and then they have the underlying psychological disturbances like a stress personalities and they end up in um, uh, chronic migraines so uh but you can uh, reverse it back like uh, how uh, by introducing them to the appropriate uh, prophylactic um, medication and uh, describe the, uh, uh, the to stay away from the you know um, the precipitant factors and uh, introduce them to a relaxing and uh, you know um, uh, lifestyle changes and then uh, Uh, including the physical exercise is very important and then the, the, the you can reverse the chronic migraine into the episodic migraine where you can treat it better um so the medication or use headache is uh, common now it's becoming common because a lot of people would end up in using analgesics and then uh, most people use uh, uh, analgesics on a daily basis or at least about 8 to 10 days per per uh, per month uh, and then the, these people end up in uh, medication of use headaches so the commonest uh, medication that in sri lanka the cause uh, mh is actually a combination of paracetamol and um, codeine you know there are many brand names available here and then uh, they go on uh, you know uh, consuming this uh, on a daily basis every 4 hourly every 6 hourly and then they uh, have this in 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 western countries uh, uh, triptans is a uh, one of the leading causes to cause emoish so they go on consuming triptans so it's a triptan driven headaches like uh, they 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 rely on heavily on triptans so uh, it's extremely um, uh, so when you go on consuming triptans so that kind of frequently and then they uh, develop um, medication of use headache more than the paracetamol codeine combination so it's very common um so uh into yeah, this is not very useful okay um let's talk about now how to differentiate uh, when you have a patient coming with a headache 
and then uh, we have to intervene like sometimes you think whether to um, image them or not uh, sometimes uh, uh, you want to reassure and send the patient and how do you um, how do you how do you differentiate uh, look for a red flag sign always uh, check few things for example like always check eye movements always check uh, optic disc and then uh, always check for a kind of a positive or a slowing of one side um, indicating of a long track signs like pyramidal tracks um, and then if they are they are like they have a policy of imaging them because you don't want any trouble and then uh, so but uh, you know sudden onset headaches uh, uh, other than the migraine there are a lot of differential diagnosis subarachnoid hemorrhage reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome and uh, cervical artery dissection vertebral artery dissection and then um, central venous sinus thrombosis pituitary apoplexia and then uh, you know get lesion in with bleeding which can cause sudden onset headache but remember this uh, uh, so the headache i mean we always think about lesion like a mass lesion or a, like a tumor causing the headache it's kind of a rare actually it's rare because the brain matter itself is not pain sensitive uh, meninges are pain sensitive in the artery arteries providing the brain is sensitive but the brain matter itself is not pain sensitive so therefore they are, if, if if somebody is developing a mass lesion within the brain matter very unlikely that it will produce a pain unless it is causing a pressure symptom or obstruction of a cyst of flow uh, or invading into a meninge so uh, so unless it's quite big quite quite noticeable and then um, they wouldn't have a pain they wouldn't have a pain uh, so the more than the pain such lesions which likely to produce uh, e, e focal uh, neurological um, uh, symptoms such as a lot of focal seizure or like a focal like a neurological weakness um, more than the headache so um, so in the elderly, uh, beyond 55 years or 50 years, uh, you, you need to suspect the uh, temporal arthritis. Uh, and then uh, you do have to do some you know, simple blood tests like ESRs. Um, and the, um, uh, say if a patient clearly says, uh, you know, this is very different from my usual migraine, it has, it has ex escalated, it, has, uh, it, it feels very differently. And also uh, in that kind of cases, you need to um, uh, image at times, examine an image. Uh, recently come across a subdural hemorrhage, Ex um, absolutely migraine, there's no question. Like, and then but, uh, he says it's something different. But, uh, but when, you, when, you do, did, when you do the CT, there was this uh, uh, chronic subdural hemorrhage. Then, then he said that, but, but three months back, he had a fall and all that stuff. So it's quite common. Um, so how do you approach uh, manage, management of the migraine? Uh, first strategy is actually identifying what precipitate migraine. So uh, go through the list, uh, describe them. Now, when you, when you are very busy, uh, you don't have the whole, I mean, the, 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 the entire time to uh, sit with this patient and go, uh, go and write all these precipitant factors and all that stuff. Instead of that, I, I generally tell them, like, uh, these are the uh, main things uh, which can cause a migraine. And I, I, I generally hand over the, the patient a uh, task of identifying their own migraine because they will have to somehow the other, uh, learn to live with the disease in harmony. So that's the bottom line. So, um, so I think any kind of in, in, in Sri Lanka, especially the school children, um, the dehydration is the number one cause. It's, and then uh, because they, they consume very little water during the daytime. So dehydration, especially in the sweat, I mean, the sweaty weathers uh, like ours, they need to have a lot of replacement. So I encourage them to drink at about 250, 300 milliliters of water every hour. Um, and, in, uh, and also like avoiding meals. Uh, that, now the migraine hits very badly during these, uh, the students uh, in their O levels and A levels. And these are the very students uh, which struggle uh, a lot to keep up with their time uh, because they have a lot of alternative uh, education, uh, supplementary education. Even at two o'clock in the night, they, 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 they get up to uh, take part of these educational programs here, internet, thanks to COVID, now it has shifted to the internet-based education. So, um, 
so it, it disturbs the, the the child's sleeping pattern a lot and that has caused a lot of migraine um so uh, ask ask about the change of the pattern the sleep pattern and the time of the meals and then they they are taking a reasonable quantity of water so uh, and and also like um, the one of the main thing would be like a sunlight uh, so a lot of people would have an increased sensitivity towards the light and then they uh, go out in the sun without any protection without any sun sunglasses they would end up in a migraine so ask about these common trigger factors and uh, try and avoid. Then also in the female, ask about the contraception methods, with the you know, hormonal contraception method that is known to cause migraine a lot. Uh, and also like uh, 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 the physical inactivity is also can cause a lot of migraines. And it, it, it can cause a lot of uh, tension type headache as well as migraine both. So, uh, and then ask them to sort of uh, do some relaxing exercises at least stretching of their legs, uh, go for a walk, that kind of a thing, that would change the entire thing. So before you uh, start on everybody on uh, medication, uh, have a, some kind of a uh, time to approach these, uh, the, the precipitants, because uh, the, you, the medication simply you, you, you will cover them on a, for a brief period of time. Uh, they, uh, in the, somewhere down the line, the patient will have to learn how to live with the migraine. So, uh, so then edu educate them uh, with regards to the, uh, the precipitant factors. So um, other than that, we are going to um, treat them for the acute attacks. And also, we are going to start a therapeutic uh, agent to prevent the future attacks, that is prophylaxis. Um, This I described um, physical session. So, um, like, uh, there are many. Uh, now, when you are uh, read about the acute migraine attacks, let's talk about that first. And then, uh, uh, even sometimes paracetamol can uh, cure an acute migraine, but. Uh, Speed of recovery is little sluggish in paracetamol. So therefore, I prefer NSAID or paracetamol in treating acute migraine. Um, I, I tend to pick a little like a long acting uh, NSAID because sometimes when you use ultra short uh, acting uh, NSAID like, you know, uh, diclofenac, it gives a little like a, a temporary relief and it kind of a rebound. So uh, therefore, um, so again, you need to give the second dose or third dose. Uh, I, I prefer naproxen for that matter because uh, 500 milligrams. So, and then uh, that would give a kind of a long uh, pain-free interval for the patient. Um, avoid opioids. Uh, do not treat headache with opioids. I think all the neurologists uh, will hate using opioids to treat the Head pain. So, I, but unfortunately, I have seen uh, in, in some some of the medical wards, uh, the opioid have been used to treat headaches. It's kind of um, uh, should avoid that kind of practice because uh, it can lead to the other issues like uh, emotion if you don't control it. Um, so, um, the famous combination to use in acute attack would be. Uh, a combination of NSAID like a naproxen and a, a triptan. Uh, we have zolmitriptan in Sri Lanka. Uh, Sumatriptan was still there, st I think still here. Uh, it's molecularly expensive. Sumatriptan is about, I think about uh, more than 600 rupees a tablet. And then uh, zolmitriptan, however, it's about 50 rupees. So it's a, a, a reasonable, it comes at a reasonable cost. And Zolmitriptan is good in a way like because second generation. So, um, uh, and uh, the rebound uh, phenomenon is less. So I, I tend to use Zolmitriptan over Zolmitriptan to treat patients. Um, the, in, in other countries, there are combination tablets available. Uh, example, like, uh, uh, you know, um, aspirin. Aspirin is a, a very good uh, choice for acute migraine. Uh, you, you have to take about 600 milligrams of aspirin. And a combination of caffeine and aspirin is extremely uh, a, a good combination uh, to treat acute migraine. There are standard combinations available like uh, aspirin 600 milligrams 
and caffeine 60 milligrams. So that's an excellent combination to treat acute migraine. Um, so, um, So how do you treat this uh, acute migraine uh, during the pregnancy? Uh, that is a real question now, uh, because we don't want to use a lot of medication for the pregnant lady. So, um, so um, I, I, what I use, I tend to use paracetamol and, uh, uh, and uh, some relaxing treatment like a magnesium uh, to treat the uh, acute attack. And then, but if the patient is not responding, uh, you can use strip dance. Uh, even though it's uh, uh, it's not that bad because like a uterus wall does not have receptors for strip dance. So you will not cause any problem uh, even if you use it. So uh, tend to use a uh, simple analgesic like paracetamol first. And if it doesn't work, uh, you can use strip dance. Um, so uh, at the same time, I would uh, explain how to uh, how to prevent attacks in pregnant women. Like as I told you, like a lot of people would have a, a reduced frequency of uh, uh, migraine during their pregnancy. Um, but how exactly uh, the the patient, if the patient uh, uh, patient has very active migraine just before the pregnancy, uh, there's a, there's a trend of continuing the same thing uh, during the the uh, during the pregnancy as well. But after the first trimester, it tends to get less and less. Uh, so if the patient is still complaining, uh, 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 unbearable headache, frequent headache during their second trimester, I tend to use a uh, low dose of amitriptyline, 10 milligram. Um, in, in the BNF would say uh, uh, amitriptyline can cause IUGR. Uh, but usually that is in the higher doses. So uh, it is accepted in generally, you can use a low dose of uh, amitriptyline to treat this pregnant patient. And also alternatively, you can use magnesium supplements. Uh, there are about a uh, you know, few uh, magnesium supplements in the market. Uh, 300 milligrams of magnesium uh, would, uh, can, can significantly reduce the migraine burden in pregnant women. Um, talk about the migraine prophylaxis. Um, different people have different strategies, but uh, uh, picking a, a, a agent to treat prophylactically for migraine headaches depend on the individual approach. For example, you need to um, uh, you need to see the patient. If the patient is uh, has a kind of a, a problem with um, uh, sleeping. And then you can use something uh, which goes with some sedation, like amitriptyline. Okay, and if the patient has a kind of a, 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 a BMI is high patient, and then then you can use topiramate to treat that patient uh, because that topiramate will suppress appetite and in, uh, in, uh, will promote weight loss, and then uh, that, that can uh, that can uh, uh, would be helpful. So, and also if a patient has a, a, a marginal diastolic hypertension, I always select Candace It will uh, One tablet you can control with both, uh, both conditions nicely. And also in the young, uh, especially young male, uh, even, even, even you measure their blood pressure, if it is touching 90, and Candace is excellent choice of treating. It, 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 it itself, a single medication would resolve their headaches. Um, and uh, people with uh, depression and anxiety, uh, I, I, I choose uh, venolfraxine in low doses, like 37.5 milligrams. Uh, that would alleviate that their, their level of anxiety, as well as it's an excellent uh, migraine prophylaxis. So um, there are uh, traditionally, we, we used to use like beta blockers, like propanolol. What happened to propanolol? Now what propanolol is extremely, um, I mean, the uh, short acting medication. You can see the it will quickly um, uh, remove from the system by the liver. Uh, the, the short acting propanolol is the one that we available here. So uh, it wouldn't last anything more than two to three hours in the in the body. So when you give propanolol, as you can see, like if you give it two BD doses, um, that is not good enough. Uh, at least you give it four times a day then. So uh, how to take four times a day for a tab, uh, tab tablets four times a day to prevent the migraine is really, really uh, problematic for a working person or a student. 
So uh, we don't have the long acting ones. The, 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 now the, in UK, you get uh, long acting ones. Uh, that is a tra trade name called Indural LA. So uh, it comes with a 160 milligram tablet. Once a day is good enough, but we don't have that preparation here. So propanolol to prevent migraine to give in four times a day is not very practical. So I tend to give metoprolol instead, like long acting metoprolol, uh, like short acting metoprolol in BD doses. That is also a good choice. Um, it, it, it has no sedation. It has no sedation. So there is a good choice in people complaining of sedative side effects for the other, 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 other agents. Um, and also a tricyclic antidepressant is an excellent choice. Uh, I choose uh, amtriptyline, usually it's in 10 milligram strength. Um, and also you can uh, uh, use other anti, 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 uh, TCS in low doses as well. So um, preventive treatment, the uh, botulinum toxin has been approved from 2013 onwards in, in, in UK. Uh, it's expensive treatment. Um, so uh, when you have the right patient to inject like chronic migraines, you can inject uh, Botox. Uh, you need to inject them in the multiple sites, about 36 sites uh, around the head. And then um, uh, it gives a good results, uh, but you, you have to choose your patient. Um, usually it works in a chronic migraine patient, which the other strategies when the other strategies fail. So and pick your patient. Um, I, I give uh, the, the great hospital nerve blocks. Uh, that is a way, good economical way of handling chronic migraines uh, with, with, with uh, tender points over the, the great hospital nerve. Uh, it's a very easy procedure to do. You can, it, it's uh, quite, quite good. Um, and, uh, you know, the uh, third hospital nerve block thoughts are becoming now increasingly becoming common in Western world. Uh, however, it, you need to inject with ultrasound guidance. So a little difficult to do it in the OPD setup. Uh, GON injection is extreme, uh, it's very possible during the uh, OPD sessions. Um, what is coming on, coming up in the future is a calcitonin gene related peptide um, antagonist. These are actually, um, uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, com uh, commercially available now in US. Uh, we don't have it here, but uh, I was told like uh, it, it will be available uh, beginning of from uh, the next year onwards. Um, so you need to give monthly injection for this. Um, uh, it is expensive yeah, because it's a new new treatment, and this 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 uh, research has spent the millions, uh, and so they need to recover their money. Uh, so uh, approximately uh, monthly treatment cost is about uh, 80,000 rupees uh, in Sri Lanka if it is available. Um, so the vagal nerve stimulants are also available. These are electrical devices, uh, uh, not available at the moment for my knowledge. So this is uh, the, and, and something briefly about tension type of headache. Um, Traditionally, it's called as a, like a band-like headache around the, around the head. Typically, uh, getting worse towards the end of the day. Um, uh, but it's a very individual uh, thing. A lot of people with a lot of work schedules, different different work schedules, would complain otherwise. Um, uh, what, what, how do you identify these patients versus, from the migraine patients? Actually, they don't, a couple of things. One thing is they don't report nausea or vomiting. They don't have it. Uh, nobody would complain of nausea or vomiting. The other one is uh, yeah, when they take a walk or take a you know, um, uh, flight of stairs, they, they, they don't get it worse. In fact, uh, sometimes walking is helpful in tension type of migraine. Uh, where the, the ten, ten, tension type of headache, where the migraine patients wouldn't walk. They tend to stay indoors uh, on the bed until the attacks pass. So can identify these people from uh, these conditions. So, um, again, tension type has uh, tension type of headache has few types. Um, the diagnostic criteria, uh, their, their physical location and the non positive nature of the pain, and also uh, not having the migraine features. Uh, how do you prevent? 
you usually uh, um, uh, the tension is not psychological tension. Now you you are, you are always referring to this. A lot of people would refer to psychological tension. It's actually the mus muscle tension which is causing the pain. You need to under understand that the psychological tension would not uh, cause a, a real physical pain, uh, but that is caused by the muscle tension. So it's uh, extracranial muscles. Um, uh, so a uh, lot of relaxing treatments, uh, all these head massages, uh, acupuncture techniques, and all that would be helpful in that way. Uh, if you use a, a pharmacological agent to treat your patients, I think uh, by far the best is amitriptyline. So we use it from 10 to 25 milligrams. Um, uh, and also prothadine also that help, that, that kind of medication also very helpful. Uh, little word about uh, tax. Uh, I choose cluster headaches and uh, uh, hemicranial headaches. How much of time? Three minutes? <laughs> okay. Um, we'll quickly go through this uh, cluster headaches. Is, uh, so uh, side lock headaches, uh, which are like uh, always, uh, it, it tend to be on a one side only. And then uh, accommodate, accommodate with the you know uh, uh, autonomic uh, features of uh, conjunctival injection, tearing, nasal congestion, and eyelid edema. And typically, it's a male smoker. And then, uh, so you need to ask about the smoking history. Uh, and then the attacks tend to get more severe attacks towards in the night time. So they wake up with the pain and has a set alarm pattern, like uh, they would report the headache comes usually around one o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, that kind of thing. So uh, it's a kind of predictable pattern. And, and also this is a seasonal quality, like uh, there are a few, few months in a year, like we get head, head pains and then they go for a remission and it comes back. Um, so how do you treat acute attack? You by oxygen, if you are in the hospital, uh, give, give give it a no, not through this uh, normal uh, venturi face mask. Uh, you, you have to use these um, uh, uh, the uh, the tight fitting face mask with a what is the name? <laughs> um, huh? Non breathing, yeah, non breathing, breathing uh, device. Uh, that's the only way to give 100% uh, uh, oxygen. Otherwise, uh, what you can give about 60% of oxygen, which is not recommended. Um, CPM mask. So, um, and then uh, the for the acute treatment, you can use triptans, but not the oral tablets. You can use uh, intranasal, uh, intranasal uh, some triptan, uh, which we used to have in Sri Lanka. It comes in the 20 milligram sprays. Uh, but now in Sri Lanka, we have a nasal spray of Zolmetriptan. Uh, according to my knowledge, one spray delivers only 2.5 milligrams. So you need to have two sprays uh, to treat this kind of patient. So five milligram intranasally. Um, so uh, how, do you, uh, how do you treat this prophylactically for this uh, cluster headache? We usually treat with them. Number one advice. Avoid smoking. So you need to advise them to avoid smoking all the time. And then uh, you need to check their pulse rate and uh, start on appropriate verapamil dose. That's, that's one of the good things. So, uh, but uh, usually when they abstain from smoking, then they will tend to resolve. And uh, paroxysmal hemicranias, uh, it's common in a female. Now that the, the cluster is more common in a male. Now this is more common in a female. Uh, that is also a side block headache, uh, comes with a multiple attacks a day and usually shorter duration of the uh, cluster headache would, uh, would result in about uh, uh, something about 20 minutes to two hours. Okay. But the uh, paroxysmal hemicranias are uh, very short, like from two minutes to 20 minutes, most of the time. Uh, where really, they can go for 30 minutes, but usually it's less than 15 minutes. So uh, shorter duration, multiple attacks in a female would suggest hemicranial headache and not cluster. Um, See, so also they also have these autonomic features of tearing, uh, eyelid edema, nasal congestion, and all that. Uh, universally, uh, they respond to um, uh, same. So start with 25 mg three times a day with a proton pump inhibitor, and then go up in the dose until the headache completely disappears. So they tend to disappear. Now, if the person is not not responding anything beyond 50 milligrams, 
I what I do, I, I generally mention them because secondary cluster headaches are very common. Uh, patients with pituitary lesions, uh, microadenomas in pituitary gland, uh, they, they have exactly uh, uh, something called uh, secondary paroxysmal hemicranias. So you need to image them. The preferred imaging mode of imaging is MRI, not CT. Here is, CT is useless, so don't, don't do CTs. Uh, always go for MRI. Um, so that was it. So uh, talking about uncommon headaches very quickly uh, uh, because that is one of the tasks. So uh, there are a uh, couple of things that I need to introduce: a nocturnal headache, hypnic headache, neck tongue syndromes, Alice in Wonderland syndromes, pneumonia headache, and all that stuff. So rare headaches and primary cough reflex and headache associated associate sexual activity. So let's quickly talk about the uh, nocturnal headaches. It occurs middle and elderly groups, and they either wake up with the headache or upon waking up the normal time, they have headache. Um, so uh, it, it associates with the disturbed sleep architecture. And then, uh, so we used to treat them with a couple of things. So I, I treat them with melatonin. That is a good, good way of handling this. And also a low dose of benzodiazepine, like clonazepam, 0.25 milligrams doses would be helpful. And a caffeine tablets available, so that 60 milligrams of caffeine would be helpful. And also a lithium carbonate also very helpful in treating these patients so in um, 300 milligrams doses per day. So nocturnal headaches. But when you, when you do get a patient for the first time, always remember to image them because uh, uh, there are a lot of other conditions which can mimic nocturnal headaches. Uh, which you need to exclude um, with, uh, with proper imaging. Something like a temporal arthritis, uh, sleep apnea, uh, and, uh, and mind you, like nocturnal hypertension syndromes. Uh, uh, so you need to uh, do this 24-hour uh, BP monitoring for this kind of patient. Uh, hydrocephalus, uh, SDHS, all that can cause nocturnal headaches. So uh, when you are diagnosing for the first time, always do appropriate imaging and do some bloods like ESRs, and also uh, ask for the history of uh, um, sleep apnea. So neck tongue syndrome. Uh, so it was introduced in 1980, um, and uh, it's an un unusual uh, head pain. Actually, it's a, a sharp unilateral uh, occipital pain associated with numbness of the tongue uh, when they have a neck a neck twist. When they, when they turn their neck, they get this typically uh, sharp pain uh, lasting for a few minutes. Um, the pathology seems to be, uh, it's a transient subluxation of uh, atlantoaxial joint uh, that stretches the uh, sensory uh, proprioception to the tongue uh, via C2 ramus. So uh, that is identifiable pathology. Uh, it tends to occur in people with uh, um, collagen defects like uh, um, uh, type 4 collagen abnormalities and, and also um, uh, patient with uh, inflammatory disease like uh, uh, ankylosis spondylitis and other, other conditions. Uh, in, in, in patients with uh, non-inflammatory type, uh, they, they, the, it's usually the pediatric onset and they get, the pain tend to get better as they grow up. Uh, Alice in Wonderland syndrome is, uh, some of you might be knowing, um, it's actually a distortion of the body image uh, associated with, uh, sometimes with headache, without headache. Uh, it's considered to be a, a, a ischemic condition in a, a non-dominant uh, parietal lobe. So there are a lot of people uh, with migraine, no, the people with migraine tend to get occasional or and rarely they, these attacks of uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland syndromes. So it's it's actually a distortion of body image size. It, they feel like they are like uh, maybe like one foot high, uh, or they they are part of the body is very enlarged. For example, there some people would say uh, my ear is ballooning out. I feel so large, but they have an insight, but it is not real. So and the, uh, these attacks could last for hours to days. And then um, uh, 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 treating underlying migraine would help. Uh, primary cough headaches. So uh, it's associated with cough, sudden onset lasting from one second to about 30 minutes. 
and uh, it happens in straining, valsalmenua, or lifting a heavy weight, and cough. All these conditions can cause uh, primary cough headache. Um, in this kind of patient, always do imaging with MRI because uh, positive, uh, positive, uh, positive cranial fossa uh, crowding can result in this kind of pain syndromes. Uh, so rather than CT, always go for MRI for this kind of patient. Again, the treat treatment with indomycin can be helpful. Uh, headache associated with sexual activity. Uh, there are two distinct patterns, uh, pre-orgasmic uh, and the orgasmic. So uh, pre-orgasmic is actually the building up kind of pain during the sexual activity. And uh, uh, usually they report it uh, in the back of their head and the neck muscles uh, associated with uh, jaw tightness. Um, and the other, other, other group, orgasmic head headaches will come with the, at the time of the climax. So there are two phenotypes of this headaches. Um, again, uh, first time of the first, when you are diagnosing them for the first time, I tend to uh, exclude um, annual similar condition by doing MR, MRAs. Um, and uh, once they, once they pre-identified this uh, headache and when it, uh, exclude other dangerous condition with imaging, you can treat them with uh, indomethacine, uh, approximately about 50 milligrams of indomethacine to be taken two hours before their sexual intercourse. Uh, Nimula headache. Uh, it's a coin type of a headache. Uh, it's reported as rare, but I come across in Sri Lanka quite a lot, actually. So the people would come across and I have this headache here, like a coin shape. Uh, generally, the diameter is about one centimeter to six centimeters in size. They always report in one side of the, one, one side of the head and one side. So it's like here, it's here, it's here, and all that. So when you when you when you when you are when you're pressing it. Uh, the, the, the pain becomes slightly worsened. Um, uh, so it's a coin shape, uh, coin, coin shape of headache. Uh, it, it, it can last from uh, hours to days, sometimes weeks. So um, uh, how to, uh, it, it, it tend to it tend to go away with the time. And if you want to treat it, treat with amitriptyline. That's, that's, that's the best response. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to take questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Dr. Bali Gurge. Uh, I think we are running slightly short of time, so we will. If there are any questions from the audience, uh, yes. One is the uh, onset of migraine, age of onset. Uh, is it common to, yeah, it's common to have the first episode of migraine after the age of 50 or in the old age. Mm. That's one question. Other one is, uh, uh, you didn't talk much about, I mentioned about the pre-drome, uh, the post-drome and the pre-drome. Do you still talk about that in uh, migraine? Yes. Uh, when, uh, um, when it comes to the description of the pathology uh, of the migraine, uh, the pre-trauma symptoms and the post-trauma symptoms are extremely common. Uh, I didn't have time to discuss in pathology in detail. That's why I had to sort of okay, shift that so topic. Uh, however, this uh, pre like uh, it's not aura. It's not an aura, but it's a behavior changes. A lot of people, the, the most commonest one would be they report slowing of the, slowing of the activity. They think slow. They speak slow. There's a considerable slowing of the activity. And secondly, they have the other symptoms. They sometimes they feel like uh, eating. Sometimes uh, you know, no, uh, sometimes they are refusing food, and uh, withdrawal symptoms. That kind of thing. So uh, it's 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 actually uh, you can map it into the evolution of the uh, the chemical pathways in the brain. So it, it's, it's there are a lot of personal differences, but uh, uh, there's a beautiful evolution of that one as well. And the age of onset, if it is over 50, do okay. you? Over 50, uh, actually, uh, when somebody has uh, migraine over 50. Uh, for the first time. For the first time. I, I usually exclude other, other causes. Okay. Uh, yes. Still possible. It's possible. And uh, prophylaxis treatment, you didn't uh, talk about flunorazine, no? We talk, you, ah, yeah. yeah so, so to be honest with you, now the flunorazine is in, in, it's common in Sri Lanka. Yes. 
but it's extremely difficult to get uh, get it from uh, other countries like England. You don't get it at all. So in very few centers like a uh, national hospital, uh, uh, Queen's Park, they have it. No other place have it in the in UK. So uh, fluorescein is a calcium channel blocker, which is actually uh, helpful in treating um, migraine patients, especially the pediatric age group. I uh, uh, it's like this now. Uh, if fluorescein once you start on fluorescein prophylaxis to get a meaningful response mm -hmm. in a lot of patients, it takes weeks, uh, approximately four to six weeks in general average. So amitriptyline tend to kick in before that, yeah. uh, but fluorescein uh, you can use. Disadvantage is actually the weight gain and then uh, the, the drowsiness. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the um, uh, dopamine uh, yeah, uh, 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 blocking uh, qualities and resulting in menstrual disturbances in, in a female. And also when you are using in the elderly people, uh, that because of the dopamine blocking uh, nature of the uh, fluorescein, that can cause Parkinson's some yeah. drug into Parkinson's. So uh, you can use it, uh, but in, in, a, in, a, in a careful, titrated manner. Thanks. One more question. Yeah. Uh, once you have uh, put the patient on prophylactic treatment mm -hmm. and the patient has been controlled and without mm -hmm. headaches, mm -hmm. how long do you need to continue? Oh, oh. So, um, so if you if somebody does not get an uh, active migraine, like you know, they don't report major attacks, for more than three months, and then you can take them out gradually. Okay. But uh, a lot of people, uh, by that time, you need to keep educating them with regards to their prophylactic and yeah. good way of living, the, like hydration, avoiding sunlight, yeah. and eating on time, avoiding sleep depression, and also avoiding alcohol, that kind of thing. So if they adhere to that, your, 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 your advisors, that kind of patient, you can safely take them out for the prophylaxis after about three months, abstain from major attacks. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, we'll call this session to a close. Then, thank you very much to, to all the three speakers. Uh, Dr. Pali Guruge, uh, before you leave the stage, we've got a little token of appreciation for the form of certificate. And uh, may I call Dr. Kamini Patirana and Manjula? So that brings us to the close of this session. I'd like to thank uh, the Association of Sri Lankan Neurologists and uh, Dr. Sena Kabandu Sena for participating and collaborating with us. And Dr. Kishara Gunaratna, who is the coordinator from the CCP side. Uh, Dr. Upul Disanayak for being here with us. He's the usual moderator. Uh, the staff of Clinmark for their support and the, star, the AV staff as always for the excellent work. And uh, this session was sponsored by Boringer Ingelheim. Thank you very much and have a good day. <laughs>